Hello, welcome to this Ask Me Anything episode of Impact the World. And if you are watching in real time, welcome to 2022, because this is the first show of the year. And if you enjoy this show and you want to support us and you're watching this on YouTube, please do hit subscribe to our channel. It really helps us spread the word about the show. And as we are an independent show, that means everything to us. So every now and then we do one of these Ask Me Anything episodes where I get to answer some of your questions. So firstly, thank you to those of you who have submitted questions. You can always do that if you leave a review on Apple Podcasts and put your question in the review. We go through periodically and pull out all of the questions and there were some really great ones. Uh, And quite a few focused on channeling today. So that's some of the questions that we're going to be answering. And without further ado, I'm going to kick us off with our first question. How do I expand my ability to communicate with my own guides? I have been doing daily journaling and find this is very effective, but I'm feeling like there is more to connect to, to expand. Maybe it just isn't time yet. I would appreciate any guidance. Well, firstly, I think it's brilliant you're doing daily journaling because whenever you give yourself the practice of connecting with your guides and the space, to connect with your guides, you start to create a muscle memory inside you around that connection. I honestly think for me, it was daily journaling. I would speak to my guides by tapping into questions that I had for them, writing them down, and then writing down what I heard. So I very much began my connection through hearing what I was hearing and then putting it on paper. This is really powerful because it also lets you get changed by the information. If you've been around me for a while, you'll have heard me say it's very important to capture this in writing, not just so that you can remember what your guides are saying to you, but also when you read it back, you will be changed by that information. So for me, there's a big difference between when I'm in channeling mode, receiving mode, and when I as a human get to process what my channel is bringing to me. And that active process, I believe, is what really calibrates us to open to more. One of the things I learned early on, and if you've been around me, you'll have heard me say this, uh, is how self-critical I was as a human being and how self-critical and self-judgmental I had become at the time I met my guides and how they were never that toward me. Now, They would tell me when I was off base or they would say, no, no, you're wrong about that and here's why you're wrong and here's how to see it differently. But I never felt judged, shamed or belittled by them. So even just that was a huge process for me to go through. And I mean, it it went on in me for years. They opened me to a higher vibration. And so I think what we often forget is we focus very much on the act of our intuitive connection And we think that that is the magic trick or the art. I personally believe that the art is allowing your connection to your intuition to change you as a human and to become a part of you. So I feel very connected to my guides now, uh, 23 years later, in a way that I didn't when they first appeared in my life. And so the very fact that you're practicing daily is fantastic and If you are meant to go deeper, keep intending for that to happen, but without any pressure, because it tends to be that we open up continually as we go and at the right time for our life, because you don't want to be blasted out into space through your channeling and then not be able to function in your human life. Now, sure, that that can happen for a lot of us. I know I had periods like that and many of you may even be going through something like that right now. But the real gold of connecting to those other dimensions, in my experience, is how it can alter the way that we interact with our human life and our human world. So that's often why it takes time for things to get deeper when you're connecting with your guides. But the other thing I would say to you is the Zs have always said this, 
They say that the real gift of channeling is not necessarily the information they're bringing through, not even perhaps the vibrational effect it has on you. You know, channeling can calm us down or it can expand us or it can make us feel very connected to our soul. They say that it's the osmosis effect of being in that energy that opens us up to our own intuition and our soul. We just get used to it. So if you're listening to a certain channeler that you really connect with and you listen to them a lot, after a while it's no longer going to seem like this extraordinary thing or this opening thing, you're going to get used to it. And the more used to being in that intuitive energy you get, even if it's through the conduit of someone else, the more you are training yourself to be open to your own intuition. So it doesn't always mean that you will then become a channeler of your guides, because that won't necessarily be what everyone's path. But I have heard from many people that being around channeling energy has helped them open to their own intuition because it's normalized it. It started to bring that very intuitive realm into our daily life in a way that is consistent and has a change effect on us. So it sounds like you're doing great, but if you really want to up the ante, perhaps expose yourself to a few more different kinds or types of channeler or other sources that you feel good about, that help you feel more open and that that can also be a way that you are increasing your own intuitive energy field as well as the practice of doing it yourself. Hope that helps and thanks for the question. I've been following your work for a number of years and have always admired how you lovingly refer to the team and the work they do behind the scenes in your various endeavors. As an entrepreneur, I've mostly worked solo because I haven't been able to find the right people to help me grow my business. I wondered if you could speak about how you built your team and what you look for in a team member. Great question. Um, yeah, so at the moment, our team, including me, is 16 people. And then actually, there are about four other people who perhaps have uh, smaller roles or, uh, you know, a few hours a month doing important things. Um, so we've become quite a group, but I remember the day it was just me. I remember the day I had my first one or two part-timers helping me and working with me. And I also am a team member. So even though you're probably familiar with me for being on camera, I'm spending a lot of time behind the scenes too. So I love working alongside the creatives and the magic makers that I work with. Um, they're all brilliant people in their own right, and they're all very unique. And when you say, what do I look for in a team member? I think back in the early days, I was often looking for someone who could perhaps add another piece for me. So someone who had a skill set I didn't have, or someone who was passionate about doing some of the things that would save me a certain amount of time. And it, it was natural to them. But where I'm at today, it, it's kind of a little different because now it's a bigger team. So I'm, it's a bigger jigsaw. So I would say what I look for in a team member is do they have the skill set? And also, are they aligned with the values that are important to me in this company? Those two things are first. And then the next thing is, how do they fit with everyone else? And is there a harmony in the group? Of course, you're going to have moments where there, isn't, there, aren't, there aren't harmonic moments all of the time, but you generally want everyone to feel that they like where they are and that they care about what they're doing and they feel purposeful about what they're doing. I've had a few learning experiences uh, with team members, as I'm sure many of you have, if you've, if you've ever led a group or where you realize that your, will in the, your best will in the world for that person to fit or to work isn't actually correct. It isn't going to be the right place for them to flourish. Uh, some people have come into the company and I've seen that uh, this is going to be the wrong place for them to actually express themselves and flourish. So I think what I look for is quite specific to who we're hiring next and what we need next. But I equally now look for 
Are they enjoying this? Is this the right place for them? Are they able to express themselves in the role? And I, I, I really like watching people grow in the role just as I've had to grow in the role all the years that we've gone through. For example, sometimes people come into the company and I've hired them more on an instinct and just a sense that there's more to them that perhaps I can currently see. And I've brought several people into the company in smaller capacities who quite quickly have revealed through my work with them and the work they do in the company, what other skill sets they have. And so it's actually been quite organic in that way. It's not very rigid for me. It's not like, okay, we need this person to fit this box. I always want the company to feel organic because I see the company as its own entity and all of us, including me, serve it. And you are in relationship with this company that we call Lee Harris Energy. You might be here for one video, you might be here for 15 years. So it has its own life force. And I always love witnessing how all of us who serve this company have our own growth and our own place in the organism. And it's fascinating to me to watch all of us grow together. So uh, I would say skill set, similar values, because it doesn't really work if you've got someone who doesn't really fit with the same way that the the heart or the the desire of the company uh, uh, goes. And, you know, like every company, we've had some people who've been with us for a while who were very talented, but it just didn't quite fit or it didn't quite work for them or for us. So um, lots of learning. But for you, I would say it's always nerve wracking hiring people. And especially when you start, I remember, you know, you're, you're worried, can I, am I going to be able to afford to pay them? You know, this is a, I often took kind of calculated risks and always was willing to bet that if I invested in the right person, then things would grow. And that's how it's been for me one brick at a time. So I would say for you, if there is a value that you are offering your business, and there are things that you're doing that perhaps either isn't your greatest skill or joy, but that you could share with someone else who might really enjoy doing those things and perhaps bring a whole other level of skill and prowess to them than you do, you're going to free yourself up to bring what you're truly valuable at to the business. So that's the way I've always looked at it. I see it very much as a team because we are a team. And actually, that's one of my favorite things about coming to work the people I, I get to work with, because I've been a solo entrepreneur and, uh, you know, it can be lonely as well. So I highly encourage you to think, what would the next most important piece for my business be? And just build one person at a time. And it tends to be that if you can get that right each time as you go, then the next piece tends to tell you where it needs to come from and who it needs to be in at the right time. So... Good luck, I hope that helps. When you started channeling your guides, did it feel odd? <laughs> did you have a fear of being judged or feel crazy about hearing voices that weren't your own? Great questions. Um, did it feel odd? Initially, yes, because I had to check, you know, what is this? And even though I had heard of channeling and I knew of channeling and I had seen one channeler in my life in person, um, it wasn't something I was particularly admiring of or wanting to be. It wasn't that I didn't admire it, but, you know, I didn't fully understand it. So when it happened to me, it did feel odd at first. And I did, I did wonder at first, you know, is this uh, multiple personality disorder? And I only thought that for a few minutes because <laughs> I asked them and they gave me all these great answers as to why it wasn't. So I did stay private with it for quite a while. Um, fear of judgment, oh, absolutely. That was the worst thing for me. That was the biggest thing for me. What I didn't want to happen was for people that I might be able to connect with and have a really nice conversation with and perhaps have a lot in common with to not want to talk to me or connect to me because of their judgments about my channeling. 
So of course, what I had to do is embrace that. I had to go, okay. And I remember my guides saying something in a group channeling. I think I was doing this in Los Angeles about 15 years ago when I was just visiting here for work. And I remember them saying, and those of you that are worried that people will think you're weird because you tell them you're channeling or you're intuitive, they think you're weird anyway. This will just be the confirmation for them. Uh, they'll have felt it. There'll be something in your energy that they're either suspicious of or uncomfortable with. That was very liberating for me because I thought about it and I thought, yeah, actually, that's okay. So I definitely had to go through this the judgment learning curve. And in a way, it's taught me to be, um, I would say, a little stronger in my own sense of self-identity because quite honestly, where I'm at today, who cares? if someone channels or doesn't channel. Like, that's not actually the most important thing about a person. And anybody who is going to use that as a barrier to connect with you isn't someone I should be trying to connect with anyway. That's kind of where I've got to. So it's actually been a real gift for me around fear of judgment. And the other thing I will say, it's amazing when you're a public channeler, how many people confess to you uh, that they're channeling, like literally, I've had everything from really high up CEOs through to people who are a mom in perhaps a suburban area come up to me and kind of say, I don't tell anybody, but I speak to my guides too. And I remember, you know, a couple of the CEOs said, I run my business using channeling as part of it, but I could never tell anyone in my company about that. And I mean, like mega successful companies. And quite honestly, if you look back through history, so much stuff has been channeled, books, music, and people talk about it, but there is still this taboo and this fear in society. So it was when I realized it was the taboo and the fear that I was actually afraid of, and how that might activate in people, it made me go, okay, well, that's part of the planet right now. Am I here for that or not? Am I going to stand as myself or not? The big turnaround for me was when I actually put on a dating website that I was a channeler, which I was sure would turn everybody off. But I, I realized if I didn't include that, um, I was going to have to sit through a lot of weird coffee dates that would eventually go south. So I thought, let's just get that out of the way. And if they can handle that, then maybe I can be with this person. So it's been a great learning for me and a great journey. And for any of you who are listening to me going, okay, I would say go for it. You know, whether you keep it private or whether you tell people, it's a really interesting measure of people's openness to you and also your openness to how they react to you and whether you take it personally or not. It's a fascinating learning. I am so enthusiastic about being a change maker on this planet and I'm embracing my creative energies more and more each day, but I'm impatient. I have so many ideas and want to do them all at once. Advice for those of us who are taking on perhaps too many projects in our desire to up-level our lives and the planet. Well, I mean, you're really smart because the answer's in your question. You know, you're questioning whether or not this aim that you have of wanting to up-level the planet is being served by you taking on too many jobs. Probably not, you know, and I think that's the truth for all of us. I mean, we live in hyper times. We've all been trained into this overwhelming time that we're in right now, which if you go back 20, 30, 40, 50 years, this isn't the speed that we were living at. So for all of us, it's probably always a good thing to go, what do I need to step back from and what, what could I do less? I think the dilemma for you is a very interesting one because you're really speaking about, from my perspective, the beauty of visionary energy. I have a lot of creative visionary friends. I am a creative visionary myself. I learned the hard way to slow down my... Um, my ideas about the time scale in which things could be built or in which things could come to fruition. So in my earlier years, when my intuition and my vision was really coming online in a bigger way, at first, I didn't understand why things wouldn't activate in time. And I would kind of throw myself at quite a few things at once. But what I actually learned was the joy of things being effective rather than things being busy. 
Now, here at my company and, and in my own work, I still move at quite a pace. But if we're not grounding something, we don't keep moving. So it sounds to me like you have a natural energy that you enjoy and you might be somebody who loves being into lots of different things at once. Perhaps you need to find an outlet for that energy and that interest in your life that is separate to you trying to build something that is purposeful. Because my sense in your question is, you know, you're, you're, you're feeling frustrated because you can't get some of the things done that you want to get done. So what would it be like for you and your body if you decided this month, where normally you would run at trying to make five things happen, what would it be like for you to try and just make one or two happen? And notice the kinds of emotions you go through and notice perhaps the mental resistance you might go through and notice how uncomfortable you might feel. But that might be really powerful for you to go through that for a month, to really dig into, well, why doesn't my body want to slow down? Why do I keep running? Why do I keep moving? What pattern inside me could I change in order to bring more effectiveness into my life? The thing we often forget is we're changing all the time, not only our world, the world around us, the climate, the culture is always changing. We're also changing as we age, as we evolve. So we do always need to slightly adjust the way that we're working. But if you have a fear of that, or if you feel impatient about slowing down, even though you're frustrated that certain things aren't working, there's something in there for you to look at. There's something you could dig into and ask yourself, well, why do I think that repetitively running at too many things at once, even though I feel frustrated, is a good idea to carry on doing. Why am I not willing to just go, okay, I'm going to stop for two months. I'm, I'm nervous about it. I'm uncomfortable about it. But I'm, there's going to be some gold that will appear if I give myself permission to experiment with working in a different way. The truth is, you might find that through doing that, you create a whole new way of being that is perhaps just 20% less than the way that you normally work. But that might be all it takes. Many, many years ago, the guides said, for most of you, the changes that you actually need to make to your lives are quite small in order to create different results. But in your head, you make things very big as humans. You tend to go, well, when I lose all the weight, then I'll be happy. Or, well, when I have this, and they're like, no, it doesn't need to be that. You're, you're, you're incorrectly creating a huge scenario or a huge destination in order to adjust the way you feel inside. They said it's much smaller than that. This impatience that you have, there's something in it. It's not to be judged. It's not to be feared. There's an energy in you. There's a fire in you. And if you really let that be in you and with you for a while and sit with it, you might be surprised at what it wants to tell you, what attention it will get from you and how that will change the way it shows up in your body and your life force. So you have time. You can experiment with doing things differently for a week or a month and really experiment and pay attention and see what shifts when you do that. I think it's a very famous quote and it's slightly escaping me now, but is it the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results? So if you want some different results, see what changes you could make to your patterns and your habits. And your visionary might just be very excited. I have a dear friend who I love and adore. She's an amazing creative visionary. And she's always saying to me, oh God, I've got all these ideas and I'm not birthing any of them. And so we always have the same conversation. And I say, well, here's what you could do to birth one. And then we meet again a year later, and it's the same scenario. And I said to her recently, I think you just enjoy it. You just enjoy, you know, the shiny objects and all the possibilities. So provided you're comfortable with what you are grounding in the world, perhaps you could let that be your joy. And you could just be in joy about all the possibilities but no longer frustrated about how you're being distracted by those possibilities and not able to build something that can sustain your life in a way that's going to feel purposeful and allow you that free time to dream. So tiny adjustment, but it might seem like a big deal if you really give yourself to rewiring this pattern. Hope that helps and good luck. 
I am feeling drawn to volunteering in an end-of-life hospice type of situation. I am excited about this vision, but when I helped my grandma with her long transition, I couldn't protect myself and ended up becoming very sick. What can I do to honor this vision but also protect myself? This is a great question because it's a little complex. The Z's said many, many, many years ago that when we are with a loved one who is passing over, you know, whether their transition is six months or a year, we go into the death realms with them to some degree. So let's say you're at the hospital bed of uh, someone you're very close to and they're, they're, they're headed out of their body and that takes three months part of the grief that you go through afterwards is you're having to come back to the the land of the living because a part of you has traveled with them, has walked with them, has been alongside them. So the death realms are incredible because even though we tend to think of death in human terms as an ending, it's actually this incredibly transformative and potent energy that you get to walk into when you're with someone who's transitioning or or even when someone in your life who you weren't with at the end transitions, it tends to open us in a way that we're often not open if we're just going about our daily lives. We open to other realms and we're reminded of the doorway that the soul goes back through when the body dies. So it's very powerful, it's very potent. The fact that you're drawn to working in it is great. It's a really interesting sign to me that that's something you're being drawn towards. Now, regarding your grandmother, it sounds like you don't yet know what it's like to work with someone that you aren't biologically and emotionally attached to in that same way. Because remember, when a family member dies, it reshuffles all of us. Even if you weren't close to that family member, even if you had a conflict with that family member, perhaps, it reshuffles the whole family unit when one dies because suddenly the energy that's represented for that family on the ground has changed. And it's a bit like taking a a chess piece off the board and then letting all of the other chess pieces find a new way to be in relationship to each other and the group. So first things first, I think it's important to pay attention to the fact that you got very sick afterwards. I, I wouldn't rush into hospice work without first doing some gentle tests to see how much of that was because it was my grandmother and there was a lot of family stuff that I was clearing when she left or I was really holding a lot for and with her because she was a family member. But for you also to perhaps just look at boundary practices in general, do you find that you have this beautiful sensitivity which makes you really drawn to walking into other worlds with people, but then you don't quite know how to get yourself back. This might show up for you if you're a people pleaser, which I know many sensitives either are or have been, and often that's happening because we're merging. We're merging with people because we love connecting, we can, it feels energetically aligned, I can feel energy, so I just move into that energy with you. But the tricky thing for a lot of people pleasers who are sensitives is you get into that place of, well, hang on a second, I lost myself. I went so into that relationship that I wasn't really tracking how I was doing or how I was feeling, and I abandoned myself in the process of connecting with this other person. We do this sometimes in wonderful ways too. You know, you're you're with a great love, whether it's a friend or whether it's a lover or someone that you're very close to. And it's only when you leave them that you remember how you feel because you were in this energy with them. So you might have a great gift around being able to walk into other worlds, but you may also need to learn how to ground yourself and recover when you do that work. Like any of us who are in the healing arts, or if you're a parent or someone who's a caretaker, you tend to get sick if you are only devoting all of your life force to the other person without remembering what your life force needs. 
You know, whether it's just a bath at the end of the day or 15 minutes to yourself to meditate, whatever it is, the self-care practices that you need to stay in your body will be very important with death work especially. So I love that you want to walk towards this and I equally love that you're just making sure that you don't abandon yourself in the process. So a few different things for you to look at, but I would, if I were you, try some gentle tests around this. Uh, very small, not massive commitments. Just perhaps see if you can gently step into what's it like to be in the energy of a hospice for you for an afternoon or a few hours to see if you like it, to see if you have a negative reaction when you come out. And from there, you can keep proceeding as you feel each yes in your body. You can go deeper into whatever training or, or work that you might need to do to fulfill that role. Thank you for your question and good luck. As a highly sensitive empath, what are some strategies for staying sane during these tumultuous times? <laughs> Great question. I try to feel positive and optimistic, yet my spouse tends to go to the worst case scenarios. Okay. Really good question, especially that second sentence. So you say, I try to feel positive and optimistic. That's great. Um, do you allow yourself to feel negative and pessimistic? I think that might be a really important thing for you to do. And I'm not saying stay negative and pessimistic just as an exercise. How comfortable are you with feeling negative or pessimistic? I know for me, I used to try and run from my feelings of depression or sadness or feeling low. I didn't like feeling like I'd run out of energy. So I would do things to fight it, you know, whether it was sugar or whatever distraction I could find or something in my past that would help me bypass how I was feeling because I preferred feeling good. I preferred feeling connected. I preferred feeling light. So I had to learn the balance a little. And I think for you, it's very interesting that your spouse tends to go to the worst case scenarios. Do you ever do that? And has it been useful to you? I'll give you an example. You know, at the beginning of 2020, when all of the lockdowns began, I definitely had to visit some of the worst case scenarios in order to cope. I actually drew strength from in the moments I felt fear about what might play out in the world. What I noticed was when I had a worst case scenario fear in my mind that I was slightly panicked about that seemed like an unknown situation, the minute I put myself in it using my imagination, and I don't mean visualizing or intending, I just mean in a more rational way going, okay, well, what would happen if that played out, Lee? How would you cope? What would you do? Then a lot of the fear of the unknown in my body went away because I gave, gave myself and the earth permission to do whatever it's going to do. And more importantly, wanted to make sure that whatever happened, remembering that I would find my way through it, both through my own will and through everyone around me, because we're all in this together, doing this together. So sometimes I think when you're in a partnership where you're the optimistic one and you're with a pessimistic partner, you know, you can play a game. You know, if they're really pessimistic and you're fi finding you're spending a lot of energy trying to uplift them or make them more optimistic, it can actually do more harm than good. I've learned this several times. Sometimes it's, uh, it's great to let that person be as pessimistic as they want and not try and lift them because it's fascinating what happens, especially if they're used to you being the uplifter. If you stop doing it, they don't want to stay down in the swamp for as long. Part of the reason they're in a relationship with you is that they like that optimism is in the room. They just perhaps haven't practiced it in themselves yet. So I think in partnerships, it's always important to remember as close as we can be with our partners, and this is true of any relationship in our life, they're also their own person going through their own thing, and so are we. So I think for you to not feel too enmeshed in having to balance for your partner and taking space for yourself if if your partner's way of being gets too much 
and communicating that, saying, I love you. I can see you're really struggling today. You don't seem to want to talk about it. And I don't think I can really help you in this state right now. And I personally need to feel something good. So I'm going to go over here and do this and I'll, I'll meet you for dinner. They might not like that at first or they might challenge you, but that doesn't matter. What you're doing is actually boundarying what you need because if you don't do that, you won't end up being great for your partner. And if you're with somebody who understands that principle, then they're going to understand that and they're going to respect that. And maybe they won't at first and maybe they'll not like it at first and maybe you'll not like it at first. But if you start to it bring that into your relationship, it lets both people breathe a bit more and it takes the pressure off any enmeshment that might be going on. So when you say, I try to feel positive and optimistic, yet my spouse tends to go to the worst case scenarios, I would look at that for yourself and go, that's interesting. Why have I attracted that? Do I need to be willing to let that negativity be a little more surfaced in myself as a healing, not as a habit or a pattern, but just, just because perhaps I've denied that or I've pushed that down. And so I created this person to play that out for me. Um, and equally, is it interesting when your spouse doesn't have your positivity and optimism, when you're not there to play that role, how do they find their own optimism and their own positivity? So I think the strategies for staying sane during these tumultuous times are practice what lights you up, resets you, calms you. That's different for all of us. For one person that's jumping around the house to heavy metal music, for another person that's meditating, it may be a combination of eight different things for you. When do you feel most open, most aligned, the least in fear or worry or your mind, the most in your body, the most open to possibility? Not certainty of doom and gloom, because that's the unknown. And that is a lie of the mind. We have to be open to possibility. So anything that you can practice, including perhaps not spending as much time with your spouse when they're in that mood and explaining in a loving way why, not judging them for it, but just explaining why for you, you need to do this for yourself and you'll be back in, a, in an hour or two whatever works for you. But I would really investigate this for yourself. I'd be curious about what this means for you and why you two are playing out these polar opposites. Because what can often happen is if you investigate a little bit of that in yourself, whether you ever speak to your spouse about this or not, you'll shift something and then they will shift something because they're in the room with you. And energy is dancing between us all the time, whether we talk about it or not. That's why if we shift ourselves, relationships and events around us tend to shift too. Hope that helps and thank you for the question. How does synchronicity work? Is it like attracts like energy? Does a sequence of events, person, thing or experience draw to it further sequences that are connected? This is a great question, and I'm, I'm certainly not an expert on synchronicity, but what I'll tell you is share some of my experience. We can get into a state of flow where synchronicities tend to be what we're seeing and experiencing more. And most of us, from what I have witnessed, go through periods of heightened synchronicity. This can happen a lot when you spiritually awaken you suddenly feel a bit more intuitive or you're noticing you're thinking about a certain friend who lives in Costa Rica and then two minutes later you turn and see this poster that says Costa Rica and you're like, wow, how did that happen? Our focus when we get in the flow tends to harmonize with our environment. So synchronicity to me is very much often about harmony. The Zs will talk about harmony and oneness being the highest octave in the universe. So when we're in this oneness state, it's that we feel and see the connection in everything. And to me, synchronicity is proof of the connectedness of everything that's going on in our lives. Whether it's you're thinking about a friend and they suddenly call you, 
whether it's uh, things that you need just suddenly appear before you've even had chance to ask uh, somebody to help you find those things, they're just suddenly there. That synchronicity tends to show you that you are vibrating at a higher rate. And the more you celebrate that, notice that, allow that in, it tends to become more normal. Doesn't mean it's a fixed state. It doesn't mean there aren't days where you're a bit more challenged or you feel you're out of synchronicity. And I think our linear way of thinking as human beings tends to make us program ourselves that way. Oh, great, now I've had a spiritual awakening. I'm always going to feel love and harmony. Nope, usually you go through a, a wave or a period. And then because you have had that experience, you'll come back into your body and your body will need to clear some grief. So you'll manifest a situation or the universe will bring to you a situation that will help you process some grief so that you can lighten the load because you've just created a higher octave in your awareness, in your body, in your energy field. So the universe tends to want to keep us moving forward and opening and synchronicity is usually a brilliant sign that you're on your path, but we have periods of synchronicity. So when they go away, it doesn't mean you're doing anything wrong, which tends to be a belief I, I hear in our community a lot. What did I do wrong? Why did I lose synchronicity? Well, because now you're surfing the part of yourself or your past that needs to heal a little bit or clear a little bit so that you can get back to living in synchronicity more of the time. My experience is the more we allow ourselves to celebrate, notice, and appreciate the synchronicities and the intuitive connections in life, the more they grow. So like anything, it's a practice. So thank you for bringing that question up because it's a, it's a beautiful aspect of our lives here as spiritual humans. Do you have any wisdom to share about procrastination? Why do we fall into it? What's behind it? Okay, so one of my dearest people in the world, um, and one of my closest friends, uh, she is often berating herself and saying, uh, oh, I'm back in the procrastination club again. And you know, we've talked about it a little bit um, through her and her experience of it. She's got a brilliant mind. She's very mentally wired. She's also very intuitive. And she also is acknowledging that some of the procrastination she experiences relates to her not really knowing what she wants and not being always ready for her body to have the experience that she might walk herself into. So I think procrastination, one of the big aspects I see with other people that can get plagued by either periods of that, or you have a lifelong pattern of procrastinating, it can be you don't really know what you want, or you think you don't know what you want, and you're afraid to choose the wrong thing. There's often an idea of right and wrong in procrastination. It can relate to very black and white thinking. And sometimes difficult things that we've gone through in life give us very black and white thinking. If you've had a traumatic childhood, you're probably going to be quite protective of yourself, of your choices. You're going to try and keep yourself safe. You might be someone who has a lot of controls in place in your life, whether that looks like being compulsive about certain things, whether that looks like being more rigid, uh, certain aspects of your life that you like to control it can often relate to an earlier part of your life that was not safe, that was chaotic, that was traumatic. So you're trying to protect yourself from replaying or reenacting those wounds. So procrastination, I think, often relates to safety. Am I safe? Will I choose the wrong thing? Which is an idea that there is a right or wrong and in truth, you know, the way the universe works is if you choose something that isn't very aligned with you, you'll get the opportunity to choose differently again. You know, if you walk into a very abusive relationship, you might go, oh my God, why did I choose that? Well, having been in not very healthy relationships in my past, I now understand why I was in them. And I'm sure, you know, other people that I have known have had the same experience or the people I was in the relationship with. We can all look back and go, 
oh, that wasn't the healthiest thing, but we were learning something. And we chose each other in order to learn it. We enlisted each other in order to learn it, but we don't have to stay in it for 80 years. We have the choice to at certain point go, oh, hang on a second, this is not very healthy. I can choose again. Procrastination, I just won't choose anything. I'll just stay in stasis. We can be protecting trauma in the body and we're scared to feel the wrong thing or feel anything. So procrastination can often be keeping yourself from an experience that you're not sure you know how to handle or process or feel. Thinking you can get it wrong, which really is just forgetting that you can always make new choices until you get it right. I think anyone who's in that right or wrong thinking, will you? I don't know about you, I've there's so many things in my life that it's taken me a long time to kind of get to a place where I go, oh, I think I've kind of figured that out now compared to where I was 10 or 20 years ago. But I had some serious lessons and smack upside the head in order to get there. So if I had never gone through any of those lessons, I would never have gone through enough revolutions in that lesson that I could get to a place where I could recognize, oh, this is how I have harmony in this area of my life. If I had procrastinated, I would never have got to that place because I just would never have chosen anything. So really at the root of procrastination is usually the energy of fear. And if you can unpick that, that could be really helpful to you. Now, remember, fear is everywhere all the time. We all have it in very subtle or very overt ways running through our system, our psyche, our thinking. So don't don't feel bad about having fear. It's, it's on the planet. It's in the planet in the planetary body, in the human body. If you can allow yourself to see moving through procrastination as an exercise, recognize I'm a procrastinator, so it's really hard for me to choose to eat this on the menu when there's 12 things on the menu and I I don't know. I mean, maybe I want all of them. Okay, maybe you do, but unless you're going to sit there and eat 12 meals, why don't you try this one today and see how you feel? And then why don't you come back 12 more times and eat all 12 things over the next six months? That would be progress. What isn't progress is sitting there trapped in fear. So I think procrastination, there's a beauty to it because you're obviously a very careful person as well. And there's a beauty to being careful. But if you feel trapped by your own cautious nature, it's time to start giving yourself safe experiments with moving through procrastination, which is why I use the menu as a good example. You know, your life isn't going to go wrong if you choose the wrong meal on a menu out of 12. You're just going to get to have experienced one meal. So start looking for small ways that you can safely invite your body to just make a choice. And not just make a choice without paying attention to how it goes afterwards. Notice how you feel. Notice where your resistance comes up. See it as an exercise. And the more you practice that, the more the body will start to trust you making choices rather than try and talk you into making no choices. So I hope that helps and great question. Oh, and I will just add, we can all go through periods with procrastination. You might be in grief. You might have had a hell of a shock. So it it can come and go for all of us. So it's always good to know some of the principles around it in case you need to pull yourself out of it. Next question is, how do we handle the distrust of our own feelings and intuition that happens when a creation that you had such a good feeling about doesn't come true? Well, when I read this question, I went right back to my early 20s. Um, This happened to me so many times. I would have this vision that I was supposed to do something. And unbeknownst to me at the time, where I was going wrong with my vision was then my mind and my desires got involved and hijacked the vision for what they wanted. So I remember I had this vision. I I was going to make a music album. It was a bold move for me. I was moving away from my training and my upbringing, which was very much based in performing arts and the theater and directing and all of those skills. And I suddenly had this epiphany around music when I started writing it. So I was convinced this was a sign and I was supposed to go and make this album. And I was supposed to go and make that album. And I thought it was going to work. 
and it was going to give me a career in music at the time. Now, flash forward now, and here I am in music, and it's great, and I'm making lots of music, and so the vision came true, but many, many years later, at the time, the loss for me around what I experienced taught me lots of great lessons about money, about patience, about how do I recover when something I thought was going to happen puts me down on the ground, depressed, sad, in shock, angry at the universe. How do I deal with that? So I think what we have to be careful of with our intuition and our vision is attaching our human desires, ideals, and wants to those visions. Because a vision and an intuition is a little bit like a GPS map. So let's say you know you're going to a party that day, and you know where the party is. It's a 30-minute drive, and you use your map to get you there. And you may have to go left and right to get there, but the map is going to get you there because the map is going to tell you where the destination of the party is. You've probably got an idea of how the party's going to go. It may or may not go that way. It may be way better than you think. It may be worse than you think. It may confirm your intuition. My point being, intuition is like a map, and our visions are like a map. They're always calling us forward towards something. And our human mind will sometimes go, oh, brilliant. My visions told me that I should be a hairdresser. Oh, this is great, because that means that I'm going to become a really rich hairdresser, and I'm going to be the happiest hairdresser, and this is going to solve all my problems, and it's going to help me leave my marriage. You suddenly, like, hook all these things onto the vision that actually aren't anything to do with the vision, and it isn't necessarily what the vision is going to teach you. So when you say, you know, how do we handle the distrust of our own feelings and intuition that happens when a creation that you had such good feeling about doesn't come true, for me, it's a little more, how do I handle my human ego's reaction to the lessons that that vision and intuition taught me that I was not expecting and that I thought was going to be something else. And that is gold. Because when you get to that point, you're more in the surrender. Because if you're so sure about one of your visions, where's the surprise? Where's the possibility for it to exceed your expectations? So I so empathize with your question, and I've been there a million times, and I now hold the visions and the intuitions with a lighter touch, and I pay attention to whether they're working out or not. And I've gone through enough rounds with that process that I know that it's, it's always worth following your vision and intuition, but I have now a real sense of how that vision is playing out on the ground. I do not put all my weight behind a vision or an intuition that is not working. I pay attention as I'm building it or as I'm talking to the people I'm going to do it with. What's the energy like in the room? Oh, I'm really excited about this, but the three people that I'm trying to do this thing with, one of them seems really in fear. One of them seems very suspicious it can work. And one of them feels enthusiastic. It's not a great formula. And I pay attention to that now. But 20 years ago, I'd have gone, well, I'll just push through and it's going to work and they just don't know. No, there's four people doing this thing with you. Pay attention to their energetics because it, that won't necessarily be the perfect formula. So for me now, visions and intuitions are no longer things I try and create in the sky. I might feel them from the sky. They might come from the sky. But I now pay attention to how they're playing out on the ground. So a little bit round the houses with my answer there, but I hope some of what I said can help you. And keep going, because the other thing I'll say is our visionaries don't always have a great sense of time. <laughs> You know, we don't, always, we, we don't always have a great sense of the timing of things. So you might be feeling something about something you think has failed. No, it was just your first failure in a road that you're going to travel that will lead you to success, just not this year, and just not that way, and just not with those people. And you'll see that those lessons you're learning now will be what helps you build that success in the future, whatever success means to you and whatever it looks like for you. So thank you for the question.
Our last question for the day is, I continue to have issues with boundaries and people pleasing. I feel like part of my personality is wanting to be liked. So I go out of my way to help people rather than look after myself. I know setting, setting boundaries is necessary, but it feels like I'm being rude. Can you give us some examples of clear boundaries that are firm without being rude? Great question. So I love that you say, I feel like part of my personality is wanting to be liked. So I go out of my way to help people rather than look after myself. The great news is the fact you're asking this question, that has clearly run out. <laughs> Being liked by other people is clearly no longer enough. And there was probably a time where that felt good, or perhaps it healed some wounds, or perhaps if you had wounds that you weren't liked for a while, proving to yourself that you were liked was enough. But that's the beauty of life. You know, we we get to a point where our body and our energy field goes, okay, well, you've, you've kind of done that now. And sure, that fueled me enough, but now I need something else. I need something a bit more real, a bit more gritty. And now you want to like yourself because that's the tricky thing. When we have a fear that we're not liked or other people have made us feel unliked or told us that we aren't liked, we often work very hard to compensate for that or try and overcome that through our actions. And the problem is you're really only ever working outside yourself and you're never really loving this beautiful you that's inside, that's innocent, that perhaps was completely innocent to some of the dynamics that you were involved in that made you start working really hard to please people. You were innocent and you are likable and you are lovable and you won't be liked and loved by everybody. None of us will. There'll be people that we really irritate or that we really trigger or that just don't get us. And that's great. That's why there's so many of us on the planet. That's okay. Because there's a group here for all of us and we're here for a group, all of us. So sometimes I think one of the things you have to be willing to do when you let go of playing the game of wanting to be liked is you might have to let some of those relationships go because they're probably very transactional or conditional. People love that you're always there to help them or to show up for them, but when you need them, they're not there. Well, you can maybe communicate that to them and say, oh, I would love it if you could help me and maybe they'll transform because you start showing up differently or maybe they'll say, no, thanks. I No, I'm, I'm too busy. They don't really care about you and who you are and what you need. They really enjoyed what you were doing for them, which is very different. So once you're doing changes, they're no longer connected to you. They can't see you anymore. So it can be difficult when you change because you do sometimes have to let go of certain relationships. Equally, other relationships transform, which is beautiful. You learn to express what you need or ask for what you need. And some friends will go, I'm so glad you've asked me that. You never asked me for anything. I really want to help you. And that will probably make you cry the first time that happens. So you've said, I know setting boundaries is necessary, but it feels like I'm being rude. Who told you that you were being rude? Probably somebody. Probably when you stopped doing what you used to do for that person who was getting from you and you go, oh, I can't do that this week. They're probably, well, that's not very nice. That triggers you. Uh oh, I'm not safe. I've displeased them. This isn't going to go very well. So probably someone told you you were being rude. And even the way that you've written your question, I think it would probably be not in your nature to be rude. You are very allowed to say to somebody, oh, when they ask you, can you come and help me get the house ready for the party on Saturday? And you're like, I can't, I've got work to do on Sunday. And they go, oh, please, I'm really desperate. I've got all these friends coming and please, I really need the help. You are so allowed to say, oh God, you know, I wish I could. I wish I could come and help, but I can't this weekend. I have a test on Monday. I have a friend on Sunday. I'm a, I actually can't they can react one of two ways. They can do the right thing, which is they go, okay, no worries, because it's not your responsibility that they've set up a party that they now want to rope you into. And any, any true friend or anyone with any awareness would understand that and would go, sure, no worries. 
or if they are used to controlling you and used to you behaving a certain way, they're gonna they're gonna either punish you, tell you off, put you down. You see this a lot in the narcissist empath dynamic, which many of you will have heard me talk about. I have a course on it. It's how these very subtle, conditional relationship dynamics hold us in place. So when you say, can you give us some examples of clear boundaries that are firm without being rude, you sometimes just have to be able to speak your needs to somebody without shaming them, without blaming them, but being clear about what you need. I had several times in my life where I was learning to speak up for myself in certain ways. And equally, I had people who spoke up to me that I that I heard and I was like, oh yeah, you've never spoken to me in that way. Sure, okay. But I think it's all about not blaming the other person being clear about your need and why you can't give them what they want in this situation. And it, it's as simple as saying, I really love you and I wish I could help. Or I wish I could, I, I like you very much, but I'm, I'm afraid I just can't. And I've explained why twice now, I can't explain again, sorry. And that's it. Now, for you, you feel uncomfortable. That's gonna be your work. That's gonna be your work. And especially if you're a sensitive, you know, I used to fill in the gaps for people. I would, uh, one of my ways of helping, and I've been helped by many people, we all help each other. So I think first, first of all, we have to get out of the martyr idea, because everyone's helping everyone else in some way. But one of the ways I would help is I could sense how people felt. And I would often work to make them feel better, sometimes at my expense. And so I had to learn the discomfort of standing in front of someone and knowing what they were feeling and keeping my mouth shut or not uh, doing an action that might help them at the moment that I could feel that if I did that, I would only be doing it to please them or to try and serve them. And I would be doing it at my own expense. Now, it took me years to figure that out and to get there. But it was very uncomfortable for a year or two for me to reprogram my behavior. And so I looked at where that behavior had come from and why I thought that was a good strategy and at what point and how could I forgive myself and forgive others and how could I allow myself to become someone new. You are not fixed, my friend. You're allowed to change. You're allowed to become wildly different. Tomorrow, you could turn up to all your friends and you are completely entitled to almost look like you had a personality transplant. And I think we forget that. We get very in our consistent, oh, this is who I am to people. Well, maybe not tomorrow. Maybe you're going to be wildly different tomorrow. You're allowed to be that. No one else has a hold over you in the way that you might think they do. So I hope that helps. And thank you, because this is a really uh, very pertinent topic for so many of us, either now or in the past. And it's very much a, a factor in our world. The more we can truly allow ourselves to be ourselves, what I have witnessed is we do become more benevolent and more kind and helpful in the true ways we can be and that we are designed to be rather than that we have created ourselves to be in response to the needs of other people at the expense of the needs of ourself. So thank you everyone for tuning in to today's AMA episode. As I said at the beginning, if you would like me to consider your question for a future Ask Me Anything episode, then just leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. And in the review, just write your question. And we go through those fairly regularly. And every time we're preparing for one of these shows, we look at all the questions that have been submitted. And we pick the ones that we think will be the best group to serve those of you who tune into the show. So whether you're watching or listening, thank you for tuning in to Impact the World. We will see you next time. Big love. Hello, I'm Lee Harris. I'm an intuitive and a channeler. And every year in January, I hold a rebirth course, a way for us to look at the year that has gone and let go of what we no longer need and look ahead at the year to come and see what we might want to create in our life. This year, I'm going to be bringing a lot of channeling to my rebirth program. So I will be channeling my guides, 
several times throughout the course of the two-week program, and they will be bringing transmissions through all based on empowerment. When I was tuning in this year as to what the overarching theme for Rebirth 2022 would be, I heard very clearly from them the empowerment sessions. So that is what they will be bringing in the channeled messages, and I and my team will be supporting those messages with a series of video and audio presentations all designed to help you reconfigure who you want to be for the year ahead. Stephen Washington will be teaching Qigong and wellness practices. I will also be doing a whole session on manifestation and creation and our habits and our patterns and how we can elevate and change those in order to bring in the new. And my team members, Marty and Wendy, will be adding some support videos, as well as an MP3 recording that you get as soon as you sign up called Your Garden of Higher Consciousness. Rebirth is always our biggest course of the year, and so we have a very large community from all over the world who tune in and, most importantly, weigh in. So we have a community forum that's completely private, and it's where you and other members can share your experiences, not only of the material, but of what's going on in your life right now and what you're looking to cultivate. So the group energy that forms around Rebirth is very strong. And we also have transcripts and worksheets. And once you are in Rebirth, you will have lifetime access to all of the materials. So even though we run most of these sessions live as live broadcasts, you don't have to be able to be there live. And if you do miss a live broadcast, you will get the replay on video and in transcript form and audio within two days of the broadcast. We begin on January 17th. So if it resonates with you to join us for Rebirth 2022, the empowerment sessions, I, my guides, and my team would love to welcome you.